Welcome, wonderful students, to lesson two of the living world topic. In this lesson, we will be exploring how living organisms in an ecosystem interact and affect each other, so that the population of one organism affects the population of others. Please write the date, title, and learning objective, and have a pen and paper ready to learn. Okay, time to review prior learning. Write one to ten. Answer the questions from memory and then mark your answers. Game time. So number one, the living parts of an ecosystem are its biotic features. Two, one role of the producers is to provide food for animals, fauna, also known as fauna. Three, the role of decomposers is to break down dead organic matter so that it can be absorbed through the roots of plants in the soil or in the water in an ocean ecosystem. Four, plants produce their own food using light from the sun. This process is called photosynthesis. Five, the non-living parts of an ecosystem, for example, rocks, soil, air, and water, are its abiotic features. Six, biodiversity means the number of different species of plants and animals in an ecosystem. Seven, different topic. Let's see if your recall is as good. The new port that the UK has developed in the north is called Liverpool 2. 8. The process in which manufacturing declines in a country is called deindustrialization. 9. Grameen Bank gives microfinance loans to rural women in Bangladesh to start or improve businesses. 10. Multilateral aid uses an organisation of experts, for example the World Bank, to distribute money or resources to LICs. Give yourselves a mark out of 10. If you got eight or above, fantastic. You are the boss. Please write any questions that you got wrong and their answers and then test yourselves on them repeatedly. Okay, the big question today is this. How do animals and plants in an ecosystem affect each other? And why is that important? I'm gonna show you a photo of a very famous living organism and some questions will appear around it. Please answer the questions about this picture. Go for it. This lady is called Ocean Ramsey and she's famous for swimming with great white sharks. I'm sure you've all heard of this species of creature. Please answer these questions. So number one, the great white shark is said to be the apex predator in its ecosystem. What do you think this might be? Might mean? Well, if you've considered it, you may have seen that the great white shark is a very large, terrifying creature, huge mouth and teeth, doesn't seem to fear anything. The apex predator in an ecosystem is in fact one that has no natural predators. It isn't eaten by anything. It's the top of the food chain. Number two, the great white shark gets its food from consuming other animals. What is this called? Well, you should have said the great white shark is a carnivore. It eats other animals, not plants. Three, what will happen to the great white shark eventually, as happens to every living organism? And why is this important for the ecosystem? If you thought about it, you'd know that like every living creature, the great white shark, as awesome as it is, will die eventually. And when it dies, its body will sink to the bottom of the ocean, at which point its body will decompose due to the decomposers in the water and on the seabed. This will allow its nutrients to be spread around the ocean, which provides nutrients for the plants, the producers. This allows something called the nutrient cycle to happen. If any of you have watched The Lion King, you'll have heard Mufasa, Simba's father, talk about the circle of life. The nutrient cycle is very much the real thing of the circle of life. This lesson, I'm going to show you what I mean. So the first important question is this. What are food chains? Here is an extremely basic food chain, and it all starts at the bottom. At the bottom, you have the producer. The producer plants. And in an, a marine food chain, which means one that's in the sea, the producer is often algae, which is a type of plant that we often call seaweed. Things like kelp, which is a very large form of algae. Algae, the producer, makes its food using photosynthesis. 
and it provides nutrients to the living organisms above it. And it's called a chain because all of these organisms are linked to each other. Each of these arrows in a food chain means it gets eaten by. So the algae gets eaten by what's called the primary consumer. The primary consumer is the first animal in a food chain and it eats plants, the producer. So it's almost always a herbivore, a plant eater. However, the primary consumer, in this case a small fish, like a clownfish, is eaten by a secondary consumer, like a seal. A seal is a larger organism that is a carnivore. Secondary consumers are almost always carnivores because they eat the primary consumer, not the producer. And finally, at the top of the food chain, you have the tertiary consumer, the great white shark, which eats the seal. And you'll notice that nothing eats the great white shark. Here's a really important idea for you. Ecosystems are made up of something called biomass. Biomass is the total weight of a type of organism in an ecosystem. So for example, if you go to the rainforest and weigh every single tree in the rainforest, that would be the biomass of all the trees in that rainforest. If you go to the ocean and weigh all the great white sharks in the ocean, that would be the total biomass of the sharks in the ocean. We usually speak about biomass based on each of these levels. So the biomass of the producers and the biomass of the primary consumer, or secondary consumer, or tertiary consumer. Here's a really important idea for you. The biomass is largest at the bottom of a food chain. If you think about a rainforest, what stands out when you think about it? It's the trees. The trees weigh by far the most out of any living organism in an ecosystem and in a rainforest. They have the most biomass. And here, is where it gets interesting because the amount of biomass decreases as you go up a food chain because not all of the producer is eaten. For example, the fish do not eat all of the algae. So some of the biomass of the algae does not make it up the food chain. And then these fish, not all of them is eaten by the seal because they might not eat the bones, they might not eat some of the scales, which means that drops down to the seabed and it doesn't move up the food chain. So some of that mass of the fish is lost. So the biomass decreases with each level. And then finally, the great white shark doesn't eat all of the seal. And so some of the mass of the seal doesn't make it up to the next part of the food chain. So it goes from most biomass at the producer level of the food chain to least biomass at the tertiary consumer level of the food chain. The great white sharks in an ecosystem, they weigh the least. Even though individually they're quite heavy, there are the fewest of them compared to the producers or any of these, which means that overall, if you added up the weight of all of the organisms here, this would weigh the least, this would weigh more, this would weigh more still, and this would weigh the most. The second reason that biomass decreases as you go up a food chain is because animals excrete their food. It goes out of them when, after they've eaten it. And that means some of the biomass is lost from the fish or the seal. And it's not going up to the next level of the food chain, which is the second reason why biomass is lost up a food chain. So key ideas here. Producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, and tertiary consumer. You'll notice that the great white shark has nothing above it. It is the apex predator. Nothing eats it. However, this is actually quite an inaccurate food chain because, in reality, something does happen to the great white shark. And a real food chain looks more like this. This is a terrestrial food chain, which means it's on land, but it could easily be a marine one as well. Look at the difference. The producer, the plant, gets eaten by the primary consumer, the snail, which gets eaten by the secondary consumer, the bird, which gets eaten by the tertiary consumer, the apex predator, the fox, but then something happens to the fox. Here, the fox dies, and its body is decomposed by decomposers like bacteria. And then the nutrients from the fox's body make it back into the soil and they provide nutrients for the producers to grow. 
And so we have the circle of life. This is a more accurate food chain because it shows how the nutrients are constantly being recycled in an ecosystem. They don't just go up and up and up. And so we get to the most important part of this lesson, the nutrient cycle. However, even this is a simplified version of reality. Because if you've really thought about it, you'd know that a great white shark isn't the only creature that eats a seal. And a seal definitely isn't the only creature that eats fish. Similarly, a snail isn't the only creature that eats plants. And a bird, a blackbird, for example, is not the only creature that eats snails. Food chains are simplified versions of reality. They're not accurate because in reality, it looks more like this. It's called the food web. And as you can see, it's much more complex, but it has the same features. At the bottom, you have the producers, except there are more than one because almost every single ecosystem in the world has more than one type of producer. And these producers are eaten by far more than one primary consumer. Even this food web is much more simple than reality. These primary consumers are herbivores. And as you can see, these primary consumers are eaten not just by one secondary consumer, but by many different secondary consumers. The frog, for example, eats three different primary consumers. The dragonfly eats multiple as well. And then you have the tertiary consumer, such as the wolf and the Wolf is a really important example here because it eats the secondary consumers. And then you have the python, also a tertiary consumer, because it eats the secondary consumer, which eats the primary consumer. And at the very top, you have the eagle, which, as you can see, is eaten by nothing. It is the apex predator. But the most important I want, idea I want to introduce you to with this image, the food web, is something called interdependence. It means this, the population of one organism in a food web affects the population of others. Let me show you. If the population of butterflies and fruit flies and grasshoppers increases significantly, then the population of producers will decrease because there are more consumers eating them. So an increase in primary producers leads to a decrease in producers. Similarly, if the frog population increased significantly, then the primary uh, consumer population would decrease because there are more frogs to eat them. And finally, if there were more eagles, then there would be fewer pythons, fewer wolves, and fewer thrushes, as well as fewer frogs and fewer rats. The population of each creature affects it, the other. Interdependence is also important because if you take one out, you'll see what happens. If you take out the python from this ecosystem, then suddenly you have far more rats and more frogs and more wolves. Because you have more rats and frogs, you have more grasshoppers. And because you have more grasshoppers, you have fewer corn plants. This can lead to a lot of producers and the destruction of the ecosystem. The more biodiverse a food web becomes, which means the more species there are in an ecosystem, the less affected that e uh, food web is by the loss of one species. But you'll see here that if you decrease the population of one consumer, then you decrease the population of producers, especially if that consumer is high up on the food chain. A loss of eagles leads to a loss of food for all organisms because the eagle reduces the population of organisms that eat the primary consumers which eat the producers. This is really important in the real world because in some cases humans have taken out some of these organisms or through extinction these organisms have died out which has led to a rise in for example grasshoppers. The grasshoppers eat all the corn and so suddenly people don't have enough food. This often, ha often happens in LICs which leads to famine when no one has enough food. Food webs are delicately balanced, which means that the population of the different organisms in this ecosystem is relatively stable. It doesn't change that much. Finally, the apex predator at the top of the food web is very important because it consumes all the organisms and nothing consumes it. 
So a food web is a more realistic version of a food chain because it shows that different organisms are consumed by not just one other organism. It also shows how the population of one organism affects the population of others. An increase in one leads to the decrease or increase in others. Okay, finally and most importantly, the nutrient cycle. The nutrient cycle simply describes how nutrients, such as minerals in a rock, how they pass through all the organisms in a food, food web and how they go round and round, how they are cycled, like the wheels on a bicycle, round and round the food web. Let me show you how this might work in a typical ecosystem. A rock is weathered by the rain and by freeze thaw weathering and by biological weathering, plants growing in it. This breaks the rock down into tiny, tiny pieces of dust and sand. The minerals from the rock therefore go into making the soil. The soil in the ground is made of broken down, weathered rocks and decomposed organic matter. This, these minerals from this rock end up being absorbed through the roots of the producer which allows the producer to grow. The producer grows larger and creates more food for primary consumers, but also some of the leaves might fall down off of the tree and land on the ground. When living organisms like leaves fall on the ground and die, they become something called litter and they start to decompose. They are broken down at the start by an organism called a detritivore, like a worm. A worm starts to break down the litter, the dead organic matter, which allows the decomposer to break it down further. However, the tree may also be consumed by a primary consumer, like a snail. As you know, this primary consumer may then be eaten by a secondary consumer, like a bird. But as with all living organisms, the bird dies. And so its body lands on the ground and becomes part of the litter and it decomposes due to the decomposers in the soil. This takes all the nutrients from the litter, from the tree, the leaves and the bodies of the consumers and it returns it to the producer. And so you have the nutrient cycle. Weathered rock provides minerals which allow the producer to grow because it creates the soil, the fertile soil. The producer leaves provides litter for the ground which decomposes which adds to the soil they also provide food for the consumers which die which are broken down by the consumers and recycled okay time to assess your learning question one why was the marine food chain that i showed you earlier in this lesson inaccurate why was it not an accurate representation of reality you should have said that the marine food chain was inaccurate because it didn't show what happened to the great white shark. Because, as with all living things, the great white shark would die and its body would be decomposed and the nutrients returned to the producer. Question two. What is meant by interdependence in an ecosystem? And how can you tell that, a, that the organisms in a food web are interdependent? You should have said that interdependence means that the population of one species in an ecosystem affects the population of others. Species of living organisms in an ecosystem provide food for other, other organisms, so they are dependent on them. And because it's of interdependence, if the population of one species changes, then the population of other species will change. For example, if there's more food, then the population of the predator will increase. Or if there are fewer producers, then the population of every organism above the producer in the food web will decrease. Interdependence. Question three. What role do rocks play in an ecosystem? And in the nutrient cycle specifically. You should have said that rocks break down through weathering, such as freeze thaw, which provides minerals to create the fertile soil that allows producers to grow. Final question. What is the role of decomposers in the nutrient cycle? You should have said that decomposers break down the dead organic matter and return the nutrients to the soil 
thereby allowing the producers to grow again. Bonus question. Why does biomass decrease the higher up you go in a food chain or a food web? From producer to apex predator. You should have said that biomass decreases for two reasons. Number one, some of the food is excreted by organisms and therefore it doesn't go up the food chain. Or number two, you should have said that organisms don't eat all of the other organism, which means that some of the food is wasted and doesn't move up the food chain. Okay, time to embed your learning. I'm going to show you some questions, answer them using your understanding, and then mark your answers. Go for it. Number one, explain why biomass decreases higher up a food chain. Two marks. Both points needed. Two, look at the food web. If a disease caused the frogs to go extinct, what effect would this have? You should have said that the population of consumers above the frogs, for example pythons and eagles, would decline because there's a loss of food. You should have also said that the population of consumers below the frogs would increase, the grasshoppers and the fruit flies. And then you could have additionally said that because the population of the consumers below them increases, this means uh, the population of producers decreases because there are more primary consumers eating than producers. Three, similarity and difference between a primary and a secondary consumer. Both get their food from consuming other organisms. Carnivores versus herbivores. And finally, explain the role of the abiotic elements in the nutrient cycle. You should have said rocks, or the sun provides energy. You should have said that air needed for all organisms to survive, or that water is needed for all organisms. So any two of these points. Please mark your answers and add in green pen any corrections. Excellent. Before you leave this lesson, make sure you watch the videos that I've linked below. Write two questions based on anything you've learned this lesson. Answer them from memory. Thank you so much for joining me this lesson. I hope you've learned something. In the next two lessons, we're going to learn about what happens when an ecosystem suddenly changes, for example, through deforestation, and why that is such a problem. Join me then.